Hello, and welcome to our web development Turbo 360. In this series, we're going to go through a basic introduction to Node.js and Express.js. So this is a good starting point if you're looking to learn web development <coughs> excuse me, using the Node and Express framework. Uh, my name is Dan. I'll be your instructor for this series. And um, thank you for watching. So first of all, what is Node.js and what is Express? So Node.js is, is a JavaScript-based runtime um, that it came out in 2009 and since then has become very very popular. Uh, mostly it has been being used on the server side, what's often referred to as the backend, which has allowed developers to write backend code, server code, using JavaScript. Um, prior to that, uh, that, that just wasn't done. So it's very popular because JavaScript is also heavily used on the front end, the client side, uh, or your browser, typically. And so it, it, is, it has been, um, it has made it possible for developers to use a single language on the front and the back, uh, making it easier to switch back and forth, uh, which is amongst one of the many reasons why uh, Node has become very popular. That's one of them. Um, but there are, of course, others. There, also, Express.js is called a web framework that uh, makes it possible to create Node applications quickly and easily. So um, sometimes Node is referred to as a framework. It's not. Node is a runtime. It's an environment. And Express is a framework that uh, is, is used on the Node runtime. And so a web framework is a tool that makes it easier to create projects by saving you the time from uh, using duplicate code, creating duplicate code over and over and over again. So any good web framework it tracks away the, the repetitive code that you would have to write uh, for every single project over and over and over again, um, thereby saving you a lot of time. There are a handful of popular web frameworks in the industry today. Um, you've probably heard of a few of these, such as Ruby on Rails, uh, Django, which is a Python-based uh, framework, as well as Laravel, which is a PHP framework. And so Express is, a, is the Node framework, uh, is the JavaScript framework for Node.js for web applications. So those four frameworks are extremely popular. There's also .NET, which is very, very popular. Uh, .NET's not a framework, excuse me, that's a runtime, but um, those, those environments are probably the, the five most popular in the industry. And um, any one of those would be a good thing to get into. So obviously we're going to focus on Node and Express. In this series, we will cover, obviously, the Node Express framework and all of its underlying pieces and concepts necessary to use the framework effectively. So templating engines is, um, is going to be in that list. We're going to use the Mustache templating engine, which is one of a handful of popular templating engines. A couple others might be um, like a, a pug, what's called Pug or used to be called Jade or Hogan. Uh, these are all pretty popular. Handlebars, these are all pretty popular templating engines. And they all kind of work the same way, and we will be using Mustache, which is also pretty popular. We'll be dealing, dealing with a lot of request routing, so any good web framework will handle request routing uh, in, a, in an intuitive way. So um, we will be ha handling incoming requests to our websites and then configuring a proper response. Um, there's also a concept called Next in, in the Node Express um, environment, and this is unique to Node. Uh, the concept of Next uh, uh, relates to what's called middleware, uh, which we will get into as well. Uh, frankly, it should be just another uh, item on this list. And uh, we will be exploring how to use middleware effectively. Um, handling static assets, so things like what, how to store your CSS, your images, your PDF files, your movies, things of that sort, JavaScript, etc. We're going to be using some simple jQuery and Ajax requests on the front end. And finally, we will finish up with deployment. Uh, we will use a couple deployment options. Uh, obviously, we'll be using uh, Turbo, which is a deployment architecture, as well as Heroku, which are two popular um, deployment uh, options, which are quick and easy, uh, cheap, if not free, and very scalable. So those are two options we will be using, which are pretty, pretty well used in the industry. So, so this is a beginner tutorial. But that's not to say it's for complete beginners. Um, if you have never ever coded before in your entire life, this is probably a bit too soon for this tutorial. 
if you go back and get familiar with the basics, uh, for in this case, that should be HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You don't have to be an expert in these things, but you should at least understand what they are and how to use them. Um, just again, the simple basics. Uh, get get familiar with Bootstrap on a cursory level, and that could be just literally, you know, a couple hours of looking at the Bootstrap uh, documentation or tutorials, and that's it. Make sure you understand what JSON is and how to read it and how to use it, and some basic programming um, concepts like variables and loops and arrays and, and things of that sort. Um, I think a good rule of thumb is if you've been doing independent study for anywhere between three and six months, that should be a fair amount to get started on this tutorial. <clears throat> uh, it might even be too much. So you don't have to be an expert by any means, but um, you shouldn't be a complete starting from zero beginner. This will be a little bit too soon for that. Okay, great. So let's get started. Uh, first thing we want to do is install some frameworks, uh, some tools, excuse me, and um, yeah, get going on that. So open up your terminal. I'm using a Mac OS. So some of these commands are a little bit different depending on Mac and Windows. I'll try to remember which ones are different for Windows and point those out. Uh, I think I remember all of them, but I might leave one or two out. But if you're a Windows user, just understand that some of the commands are slightly different and you might have to Google your way around. So first thing we, we need to do is make sure you have Node.js installed on your machine. Um, Node.js.org go here and make sure you have the download the LTS version and um, don't download the current version yet sometimes there are experimental features in here which can get a little bit uh, screwy so you want to download the LTS version for now and then run through the install packages that should take about two minutes and once you do that let's check the version number so you head over to your terminal and you do node-v and it will give you the current version number installed on your machine. And obviously I'm one step behind, but it's not a big, it's not a big thing, it's pretty close. <clears throat> so the node package also comes with the something called the node package manager or NPM for short. And that should come installed with the node installation as well. So what you want to do is check the version number there as well and make sure you have an NPM version. I guess I should get an update soon. Um, and then uh, you should be good to go once you've confirmed that both of these are properly installed on your hardware, on your computer. And then once you have that set to go, um, for now we should be good to go. So real quick I'll explain. Uh, the Node, the NPM system is the, is the major package manager for Node. Um, and we use that to install packages, of course. Packages can be installed one of two ways. They can be installed locally or globally. So the difference is when you install a package globally, you're installing the package on your computer. It's kind of like installing regular software on your computer. So it goes into your, onto your machine so that you can use it anywhere on your machine. When you install a package locally, you're installing that package inside of a project, a specific project, and it only works within that project, and that's called a local installation. We will be using both um, in, throughout this tutorial, so you'll have a good sense of when we're doing one versus the other and uh, when you need to use one versus the other. So for now, we're good to go in terms of what uh, tools we need to get started, just Node and NPM, and that's it. Um, along the way, we'll be installing some more software as we need it, but for now, we should be good to go. In the next video, we're going to get started with creating a very, very basic Node Express project uh, from scratch, from the bottom up. And so we can identify the pieces uh, at the most simple level. So that's where we will begin this tutorial. So uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Hello, and welcome back to our tutorial series on Node.js and Express.js. In the last video, we installed Node and NPM on our computer to make sure we have what we need to get up and running. So in this video, we're going to create a very, very simple Node Express project from scratch so that we can understand the underlying pieces for every Node Express application. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to open the terminal. And just to make sure everything is working on your end, do a quick version check for both Node and NPM. Make sure you have valid outputs on, on either one of these. And once you've confirmed that, let's head over to, uh, I'm going to head over to my desktop, but obviously you can go wherever you do your work. 
and let's create our first project. So I'm gonna create a directory and let's call it first project. And so here it is right here. And then I'm gonna CV into the first project. So I'm now currently inside the first project directory. And let's create our first project. So uh, the way we do that for a node project is we do npm init. And this will create our first node project. Now what's gonna happen is it's gonna ask me a series of questions about my project. Uh, for example, the name, the, the version number, uh, description, things of that sort. Uh, for now, we're just going to go with the defaults. So we can just press enter all the way through. <clears throat> and then finally press OK. And you'll see here what happened was it created a file called package.json. And the package.json file is kind of like the central point of every node application. It's where the projects sort of uh, details, configuration details are, are, are laid out. So in this case, those details are the name, <coughs> excuse me, the name, the version, description, etc. Excuse me. So what we want to do is well, we want to uh, add more configuration to this project. Obviously, this is not really a project, it's just a file. So what we want to do first is we want to add more dependencies to our project so that we can uh, add more functionality. So the way we do that using Node and NPM is we use the package manager NPM to install dependencies. So the first dependency, and for this video, the only dependency we're going to install is Express, the web framework. So here is how you install a, um, a dependency inside of a project and then we do dash dash save like that. So you may remember in the intro video I said there are two ways you can install libraries uh, locally or globally. What we're doing here is we're installing the library locally so that this library express the framework will be uh, installed locally in this project only and not globally on the machine. So let's go ahead and do that and you'll see here a couple things happen. You see this folder pop up, we've got a new package.lock JSON file, package lock.json file. Uh, the, so this is what's the impo most important thing to note here is the node modules directory is your dependencies folder. This is where all your dependencies end up inside of a project inside of node, inside of a node project. So if I open this up, I'm going to see a few dependencies, quite a few. And one of them is going to be Express, as you see right here. Uh, you may be wondering, we only installed Express, why are there all these other folders, all these other dependencies? That's because Express itself has several sub-dependencies, which were also installed inside the node modules. So the Express dependency itself has clearly a few, quite a few of its own dependencies, which were installed as well. So the important takeaway here is that the node modules folder is where the dependencies are stored. Another thing to note, is if we open up the project in our text editor, I'm going to use Sublime, you'll see in the package.json there is a, a new entry called dependencies where we have express um, listed and that's because we did the npm install right here um, and that, that will add the library to the dependencies list in the package.json. So remember the package.json is kind of the project's like table of contents. It, it shows everything the project currently uses and, confi and configurations. So we have everything we need to create our first Node Express project. So let's go ahead and do that. We need to create a JavaScript file to run the project. So uh, if you look here on line five, it says the, the main entry point is index.js. So we should create that. So go ahead in your directory and let's create the index.js file, which is now right here. And here's where we will create our server, our Node Express server. So first thing we need to do is we need to import the Express uh, framework. So let's do that. Okay, and this is how we import a library from the node module. This is exactly how you do it. So if we want to use one of the node modules, uh, this is how it would go. 
and uh, let's create our Express application. So that would be, and we instantiate it like that. It's basically just a function using Express. And then what we need to do is set up um, request handlers or a request handler so that we can respond to an incoming request from the website. So uh, let's do that right now. So app. Okay, so a couple things right here. Um, we are setting up a get response handler or get handler. Uh, get is a type of HTTP request. Uh, it's the most common type. It's what browsers send out get requests. So when you visit a, a website like google.com, you are sending a get request to the Google uh, servers. Uh, this string argument here is just uh, slash indicating for the home page. So we're indicating that for the home page, please um, uh, handle the response uh, uh, the following way. Now we did not configure the response yet. There's one more argument here we have to pass in, which is going to be a function argument. So it's a function. And the function argument itself has three of its own arguments, which is rec, which is request, res, which is response, and next. Now we won't be worrying about the next for a while, so I'm just leaving it in there to be thorough. But what matters are the request and the response. And inside the response object is where we can actually configure the response to send back whatever we want. So in this case, we're going to tell the response object to send back a hello message so that we can clearly see whether or not it worked. And so for now, this is good enough. This is a valid uh, response. So now what we need to do is connect the app to the server by doing app.listen. <clears throat> and then inside the listen function, we pass in what's called a port number. Uh, don't worry too much about port numbers for now. Um, just understand that the common port numbers uh, in, in local development environments are usually 3,000, 5,000, 8,000, or 8080. So these are typical port numbers, um, 8,000, 8080. But between these, it doesn't really matter which one you use. They're all kind of the same. So now what we want to do is run the server uh, using Node. So we go back to our terminal, and we make sure you're in the root of the directory, and we do Node and then the file name index.js. Technically, we can just do just index, and that's it, because it's a JavaScript runtime, so the JS is implicit. But if you want to be really thorough, you can just do index.js. It's all kind of the same. So now we're running the server, and so we can go to our browser now and check port 3000 or localhost 3000. So if we do localhost 3000, we see hello, and that means it worked. So we have created our first Node Express application and had it uh, tested the response um, by making sure we see this hello string in the browser, which is this response right here. So to turn off the server, we go back here and we do Control C and that will turn the server off. Now, if you're on Windows, I believe it asks you if you're sure you want to do it. So just press yes. Uh, and then the server will be off. So if I go back to localhost 3000, uh, nothing will work. It'll, just, it'll crash. So that's it. So this is how you create a Node Express project uh, uh, from scratch. I'm gonna do a few more things in the next video and then to, to, to get through the uh, architecture, to describe the architecture, but this is how a Node Express project is created from the bottom up. And the important takeaways here are um, what the package.json means, how to read this, uh, the Node modules, what, what's going on there, and uh, how to install a Node module. So those are the important takeaways. So hopefully you got all this working, and, um, and that's it. So I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Hello, welcome back to our tutorial series for Node Express, Node and Express.js on Turbo 360. In the previous video, we set up a very, very simple project from scratch and set up the first request response uh, handler on our Node Express application. In this project, we, in this video, we're going to continue that out a little bit and build out a few more response types, as well as structure our application a little bit more, um, more modular, modularly, 
so that it becomes it looks more and more like a standard project. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to open up the code from the previous video. And let's go ahead and run the code to make sure everything still works. So here is the terminal. I am in the root directory and we're going to do node index. And then head over to localhost 3000 to make sure everything still works, which it does. So that's great. Go ahead and turn off the server by doing control C. <coughs> Excuse me. And then here is the index file showing all the code we did last time. So basically all the action is happening right here in between lines 5 and 7. So what I want to do next is show a different, a couple different kind of response types. Um, so let's go ahead and copy these three lines and then paste it beneath the first handler. I'm going to extend the path a little bit. It's called the path. So I want to say uh, JSON. And then in this handler, instead of sending back a string, we're going to send back a JSON object. So uh, this is for if you want to send back just raw data to the browser or whoever is making the request. It might be an iPhone or an Android app or something like that. So the way we do that is we create a data object. And uh, this is just a set of key value pairs. So let's say um, key and then, or let's say uh, greeting, hello. <clears throat> and then in the response, instead of send, we just say JSON, and then we pass in the data object into the actual uh, response handler. So this time, when I go back and run the server, node index, I still have the original handler set up, but now keep in mind we added another path called slash JSON. So if I do localhost 3000 slash JSON, I will now get the JSON response that I set up over here. So that's another type of response that is very typical um, uh, in, in, in a Node Express application. And in another type of response is a rendering actual HTML content. So um, that's, that takes a little bit more uh, pieces to connect. So what we want to do is we want to create HTML templates or pages and then render those pages. Um, however, I'm, we want to do that using what's called a templating engine. And the, the reason we use templating engines is so that we can inject data into those HTML templates and then render data dynamically. So we're going to go ahead and do that um, by setting up our, our, our templating templates directory, or sometimes the, it's called the views directory and then connecting our templating engine to render these pages. So let's go ahead and do that first. First thing we want to do is turn off the server. <coughs> and then I'm going to create a new directory inside the project called views. And that's going to be right here. And there it is. And inside the views directory is where we're going to store our HTML pages or sometimes what's called, sometimes referred to as templates. So we want to create a template, uh, let's call it home.mustache, and it's going to be .mustache because we're using the mustache templating engine. But this is just a regular HTML file, so you don't have to uh, look at it any different than that. So inside here we have our home.mustache, so I'm just going to create HTML tags. <clears throat> Whoops, right there. Okay, so here is our basic HTML for the home template. And so now what we want to do is render this template um, using our templating engine. So we can't quite do that yet because we don't have the templating engine properly installed. So we want to do that next. <clears throat> so in order to do that, we need to set the views directory and then we need to install the templating engine and then set the templating engine. So let's do that in that sequence. 
So let's set the views directory. So what we need to do is import the path module, which is a built-in module, so there's no need to npm install it. And then we're going to set the views directory um, to this directory right here. So we do app dot set and then we're specifying the views directory and then we're using the path module to get the current location, the cur current directory location and then that's this right here and then views. So this right here is referring to this folder right here so we're now telling the Express application to use the views directory to find the necessary templates. So that is now being connected. So now what we need to do is install the templating engine. And that's going to be a module, an npm module. So you open up your terminal and we do npm install hjs. So this stands for Hogan JS. And then don't forget to do save like that. And then we need to install Hogan middleware. And this will enable us to use the mustache templating engine. It's a little bit confusing because the namings don't match up, but that this will enable us to use the mustache templating engine. So now what we want to do is connect the templating engine by setting the view engine of the application. So we go back to app and then set, and now we're setting the view engine, which is really the templating engine, same, same difference. And then what we want to do is specify the mustache templating engine. And then last but not least, we have to specify the Hogan middleware, which enables the mustache templating engine to be properly used. So that's going to be right here. And then we require the Hogan middleware. Library, specifically the express configuration. And I spelled that engine wrong, so make sure we catch that. And this should be good for now. So now what we've done here in these three lines is we've set the views directory to this folder right here. We set the view engine to be mustache. And then we told we specified the the Hogan middleware uh, for the for the Express configuration. This this part is probably the most confusing, but don't worry about that for now. This is just what we need to connect the mustache templating engine. So now what we can do is render this home mustache template by creating a separate route just for that. So let's go ahead and create a new route. Call it home. And just like the other ones, it takes a function argument, which has rec, res, and next. And this time, the res is not going to be send or JSON. It's going to be render. And the render argument takes, the render function takes two arguments, the template and some data. Now, we're not going to pass in any data, so just put in null for now, because we can just leave it alone. Here we enter the template name, which we only have one template, which is home, so we can just enter home. Excuse me. Enter home like that, and this will then route to the views directory, grab the home.mustache file, and then render this HTML, hopefully. So let's go ahead and try that. So we go back here and we do node index. Head over to localhost 3000. Here is the first route. Here is the JSON route. And then let's try the home route. And here we go. So here we have successfully connected the application, the Express application, to the views directory and then the mustache templating engine with the Hogan middleware. Um, properly specified. Another way we could have done this on line 7 is Hogan and just require it up here 
which is probably more typical to be honest. So we can do that and then grab the reference, the Hogan middleware, and then do this like so. Uh, this might be slightly more conventional in terms of notation. So you might see it that way instead. So I'm going to turn off the server and then run it again. And then here it is. So everything still works fine. So that's good for now. We connected the uh, the view engine as well as set the view the templates directory and we showed three common types of responses that you see in a Node Express application. There are a few others but these are by far the most common. Um, so in the next video we're going to continue building out the basic structure of the project a little bit more by adding a, um, a an area for static files so CSS, JavaScript and things like that. So hopefully you got all this working and, um, and that's it. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Hello, welcome back to our Node.js and Express tutorial series on Turbo 360. In the previous video, we set up a couple sample routes and connected the templating engine so that we can render raw HTML pages from our application. So uh, that's a good start to our project. In this project, we're going to continue the setup. In this video, excuse me, we're going to continue the setup by connecting our static assets and then organizing our routes in such a way that it makes it easier to maintain the code. So let's go ahead and get started. Here is the code base as of the end of the last video. Whoops, I'll make this a little bit bigger, it's easier to see. And I'm going to CD into that code base. So I think it's first project. And I'm going to run the server. Now, one thing that I didn't do that I normally do in my projects is at the end right here, after the server uh, connection, I do a console log to make sure that the server, I can see visually that the server is running. That way when I run the server, and you should do the same thing so you can visually see, when I run the server you will see that console log and we can quickly know when the server is turned on. So if we head over to the local host Sorry about that. We can just check the routes and make sure everything still works. So good to go. So now I'm going to turn off the server. So control C. And the next thing we want to do is we want to connect our static assets directory. So static assets are for um, images, uh, CSS files, uh, PDF, uh, JavaScript, things like that. And generally, we want to have a single, direct single directory where all the static assets are um, stored. So let's go ahead and set that up. So I'm going to create a new directory. I'm going to call it public. And that, this is where the static assets will all be maintained. So let's CD into that. And uh, in the most basic projects, we have three types of static assets. We have images, CSS, and JavaScript. So let's create directories for each one of those. So images, CSS, sometimes it's, this is called style, either or is fine, so CSS, and another one for JavaScript. So now we have our three subdirectories for our primary static assets, and that's good to go. Now the next thing we need to do is configure our Express application to, so that it knows where to find all the static assets. So that's really uh, just one simple line uh, setting the static asset directory. So that is going to be app.use and then express static and then we set the path again just like we did with the views directory. So basically we're telling express to find all static assets in the public directory. 
So hopefully that makes sense. So now what we can do is we can create our first static asset and make sure that it works. So if we head over to, um, let's see the best way we can do this. So let's head over to Google Images and let's find an image. So Node Express. Okay, let's grab an image from Google. and download this into our project. I'm on the wrong desktop, so right there. Okay, and we'll call that Node Express. Okay, so now what we can do is we can open up our project and then go to the public directory and then the images and then place this image inside the images directory, obviously. And then inside the code, if we head over to our home.mustache, we can now import that, import that image or render that image inside the HTML. So if we do IMG, now here's the important part. Uh, we do images and then the name of the image. So node express, like that. Notice how we left the public part out of it because that part is already uh, implicit because of the setting that we established here. So there's no need to say public. This would actually not work. Uh, we don't want to do that. The, the public directory is already set right here. So we can just directly reference the sub subfolders inside the public and the, the public part of that is implicit. So now if I run the page, the server, head back to localhost, and I don't see it. So let's see what went wrong here. Oh, the code's not rendering, so let's see. Oh, home, excuse me, my fault. So we want to do slash home, and there it is. Okay, so it worked. So we are good to go. So this is a uh, one example of a static asset. Um, we can also do a CSS file. So if we head back, we turn off the server, head back to public, and then CSS, and then we can create a style CSS, and then go back to the root level. Inside here we can do, um, let's see here, H1 and then color, and then make all header one uh, tags red in text appearance. So this is an H1 tag, so it should show up as red once we import the uh, style sheet. So here I'm importing a CSS style sheet, and just like over here, same thing, we do not need the public prefix, we can just say CSS and then style.css, and again just to be clear, this is the way it works because inside the app.js we established the public directory as the static asset um, root directory. So if we reload the server or rerun the server, head back to localhost 3000, this should now reappear as red, which it does. So that means the assets were successfully imported, so here and here and you can actually click on these to make sure that they are showing up. So here is the CSS and here is the direct image and that has all been successfully connected. So that is how we can connect our static assets inside of our Node Express application. That's a very simple way to do that. So that is the primary way to do that. So now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to reorganize some of our routes. Uh, going back to our last video we set up three get routes to handle some basic types of requests. Now in any typical web application there are more than three routes. There are several dozen routes typically. So you can pretty much see where this is going to go. This is going to get pretty convoluted very quickly. So normally what we what we do is we separate these routes into a different folder uh, called the routes folder. That's pretty intuitive. So let's create a new directory called routes. So routes and then let's cd into the routes 
And then I'm going to create a wrap in here called uh, index. And now we have a separate file uh, inside the routes directory whose job will be basically to do this. It'll be the same, creating the same routes. So um, let me get rid of these first. Okay. So inside the routes directory, we're going to need express again. So it's the same thing. We just do require express. And then we're going to use a router from the express library. So express and then dot router like that. And then we want to do module export. Okay, and then we want to export the router, and then in between here is where we set all the um, request handlers, the gets. So what we can do is we can do router.get, and then it's the same thing. We just insert the path, and then the callback, the function callback, which takes a rec, a res, and a next. And then here, in the response, I'm just going to send back a hello from routes folder so we know that it's coming from this folder and uh, that way we can be certain that uh, we're, we're connected to the correct route so now what we want to do just make sure you have this is we want to go back to the app.js the index.js and now we need to import that route so let's see um, index equals require routes and then index. So you can see here on line 27, I am importing this index route. Let's call it an index router. Let's make it a little bit easier to understand. And then let's see what we want to do is we want to do app dot use. And then we set the path here. And then index router, we just pass in the entire thing. Now what we're going to do is we're going to comment out all of these previous routes because instead we want to use this dedicated route folder route file to handle the requests. Because like I was saying a few minutes ago, if we put all of our routes inside the index.js, the root direct the root folder, the root file, excuse me. Uh, that file will get very big very quickly and it'll, it'll become unmaintainable. That, that's considered poor form. So let's give it a shot. So let's head back here and run the server. Routes index. So I forgot the period here. My mistake. So to reference this directory, it should be period slash and then the file path. So I apologize. Let's try it again. We are good to go. Um, just for good measure, let me show you how I quickly deduce that because debugging is an important skill. So that was not intentional, but here what happened was I got an error message and then it says it cannot find this module. So that, that uh, message is telling me where things went wrong. And the only way this would be happening is if I made a typo here. So I may have misspelled something or I have the wrong path. And that's that's in this case that's what happened. So I corrected the path. So quick, simple debugging, it's something you should get used to because it's gonna happen a lot. So going back to our project, we should now hope to see hello from routes folder when I go to the home page. So let's try that. And here we go. And that's it. So now we are using the routes the routes folder to respond to requests. So if I do router.get and then just like before home rec res next we can do the same thing. We can do res.render and then we can get the home.mustache and pass in null for the data. So we're basically rebuilding our previous routes but now we're doing it inside this routes folder so that we can make sure everything works. So here's the home page, and then here is the previous mustache template. Uh, and just for it to be thorough, let's reconnect to the last one. 
which was a JSON response. And here we pass in a JSON object, and I think before we had greeting, hello, so greeting, hello, from routes folder, okay, and then we can try that. So JSON, and there it is. So now once we've confirmed that, we can remove these previous routes from the app.js and it's important to understand now this is more a more modular architecture so we can create more routes inside the routes folder as well and then connect them over here and leaving this file a little bit more concise which is really what we're going for and much of the actual request logic should end up in here so this is moving towards more general basic architecture of a node express application so um, hopefully you got all this working, and in the next video, we will continue uh, building this out. So uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Hello, and welcome back to our intro to Node Express tutorial series on Turbo 360. Thank you for watching. In the previous video, we set up our public, our static asset directory by placing our CSS images and JavaScript files in the public folder of the project and then configuring our project to use that folder uh, for all static assets. So if we open up our index home.mustache, these static assets here are being referenced from the public directory as per this command right here. So let's go ahead and just make sure that still works. So here I am in the root level of the project and I'm going to confirm that this still works as before. And here we go. And if we check the roots, we have a home page route. So let's go ahead and double check that as well. And here is the home.mustache file that we set up. So everything is still working, everything looks good. So let's go ahead and turn off the server. So now what normally happens in a typical Node Express project is that the project continues to, to build out inside the, the main entry point, in this case the index.js, and as more and more modules and dependencies are added. But typically these modules and libraries that we use are, are used in a lot of projects, very common libraries. Um, that are used over and over again. For example, um, what's called the body parser for posting for parsing uh, uh, post parameters from a web form, something like that. Um, and so you end up installing a lot of libraries, the same libraries, over and over and over again for every single project. This can get a little bit tedious after a while. So what typically happens? Um, what a lot of developers typically do is they use what's called a, a scaffolding engine or a generator. Typically they're the same thing, which <clears throat> creates projects out of the box wherein a lot of these configuration options and dependencies are pre-installed so that you can get up and running right away. Now that's not to say you shouldn't know how to set these things up from scratch, which is why we started this way in this tutorial, but what we're going to do now is use one of these scaffolding engines or generators to create a project with a lot of these configuration options, tools, and libraries already built in so we can go from zero to building out actual project logic right away. That's a very, very powerful tool of a, of a generator. It's a very powerful feature of a generator. It's, it's actually why generators exist. So we're going to go ahead and use one right now. So go ahead and turn this off and I'm going to CD to back to my desktop and I'm going to install a generator called the Turbo CLI. So CLI stands for Command Line Interface. So I'm going to do sudo npm install Turbo CLI like that and then the dash G is for global. So generators are almost always installed globally on your machine. Now keep in mind if you are watching this on a Windows machine you do not need the sudo. So you can ignore that part if you're working off Windows. 
if you're using Mac or Linux, then don't forget the sudo. So go ahead and install that. It's going to ask for your password. So just go ahead and enter your root administrator password and then install the Turbo CLI. The Turbo CLI is a lot of things, but amongst them is in a Node Express generator. So we're going to use the generator feature of the Turbo CLI. So one thing you want to do real quick is check the version number and make sure you have a valid version number which is this right here as of the date of this video so you should see a number that matches that or higher so depending on when you watch this video so I'm back on my desktop I'm now going to create a new project turbo new let's call it um, let's see sample project <clears throat> and you will see on the desktop a sample project shows up and before we do anything, let's open that up so you can see what's inside. So inside here, you should see a project structure that should look pretty familiar. There are a couple, a couple other files already added, but the main things are already in place that should look fairly familiar. We have our views directory with an index.mustache. We have a couple route files. We have our public directory for our static assets. And we have our app.js where the app is set up and configured just like before. It looks a little bit different because it's the configuration options are not identical but it's basically the same concept. So what we want to do, the important thing to understand here is that a lot of the basic configuration is already put in place for us so that we don't have to do the same thing over and over and over again. So we've essentially scaffolded a fully functional project. Uh, and then don't forget the package.json which already has a few things built in and this is where the scaffolding uh, really really helps out so these are all the dependencies that we we don't have to install manually on our own because the scaffolding engine or the generator same thing uh, took care of it for us now if we cd into the root directory of the project uh, an important thing to understand here is that the package.json lists the dependencies but the the dependencies themselves are not installed. So to install all the dependencies at once, it's very simple. All we do is npm install, and that's it. We don't need to list anything. We can just do npm install, and it will go through this list of dependencies and install each one into the node modules folder. So you will see there's no node modules directory here because it doesn't install automatically, but now it just popped up because we ran the npm install and it is currently installing all the libraries into the node modules directory and now it's done so now we have we should have a fully functioning project so we can test that by running the server uh, we're going to use a tool called nodemon to run the server so we do want to install this globally so that um, because nodemon runs in your through your system so the first thing we want to do sudo npm install nodemon-g to make sure you have nodemon globally installed. I'm not going to do it right now because I already have it. And what this does is it runs the server for you but it keeps it running while you're editing files so that you don't have to keep on restarting the server. So if I just run nodemon from the root directory of the project I should see this. It is now watching the files and I should be able to see the project over on localhost 3000. So here we have the scaffolded project, the generated project from the Turbo CLI and if we look at the app.js you'll see that we have two routes, the index route and the API route. We're not going to use the API route so we can ignore that and inside the index route is where the home page is being rendered see res.render which is what we did last time and then here we have a couple other sample routes just for demonstration we're going to get rid of these because we I kind of want to start this from scratch so let's go ahead and break this down to the most simple route that is currently being used which is this index route right here and now we're pretty much back to where we started at the end of the last video but instead we're using a generated project uh, using a scaffolding engine. So again, this is a very common tool 
that developers use to quickly get up and running and get something uh, that works right out of the box in seconds rather than building the same thing over and over um, for every single project. And again, the project structure of this scaffolded uh, template is um, scaffolded project is the same as last time. So our static assets are over here. We have our index.mustache, which is currently the home page where it says welcome to Turbo. Welcome to Turbo. Um, and the routes are over here. So uh, we're back to where we were at the end of the last video, but in seconds rather than minutes. So that's, uh, that's why we're using this. If we head over to the app.js, you can see over here we have some configuration options for if we want to change the static asset directory. Maybe instead of public, we want another folder called assets. If we want to change the views directory, sometimes the people use uh, a views directory called templates rather than views. It's really up to you. Um, but that's how you would make those configuration changes uh, using this generator. So um, that's worth pointing out. So good. So uh, you don't have to use a generator. You can certainly create everything from scratch every single time if you want to. It's not a problem. Um, there's nothing wrong with that per se. Um, but over time, you will find that it gets repetitive, and it just seems to be more efficient if we if you use a generator. So there are there are other generator options out there, um, but they all fundamentally do the same thing. And the project structure typically falls under this general general uh, architecture. Uh, the only differences tend to be pretty subtle, like instead of uh, mustache templating, it might be Hogan, it might be Handlebars, just a, just some other templating engine uh, instead of mustache. So, um, Or maybe instead of public for the asset directory, it's just assets, very common naming convention. So uh, things of that sort are, are the, tend to be the differences and not much else. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. So this is a quick video on just Getting a, getting a project up and running using the scaffolding engine. I'm going to turn off Nodemon. So control C to turn off Nodemon. And uh, in the next video, we're going to get into the actual nitty gritty of a Node Express application and start handling and manip manipulating requests and um, breaking down how to deal with incoming requests um, with a variety of response types. So that's it. Hopefully, you got all this working. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Hello, welcome back to our tutorial series on Node.js and Express.js on Turbo360. In the last video, we set up a new project using a project generator, which makes it very quick and easy to create a project with, with a general structure right away so that we can dive right into the coding and start building out our application logic. So in this video, we're going to do a little bit of that by exploring different request types and how to handle various request types and responses so that we can parse out data and be a little bit more dynamic with our request and responses. So here's our project so far that we scaffolded at the end of the last video. Um, here's the app.js where everything is set up and connected and if you look here we have two routes already um, connected. Uh, one is called index and one is called API and we're not going to use the API routes. Let's go ahead and just get rid of that so we can make this even simpler. And now we only have the index route. So I'm going to cd into the project root directory and just run the server to make sure everything is still in working order. So sample project. <clears throat> so here I'm using nodemon which we installed in the previous video as well to run the server and remember nodemon enables us to run the server and keep it running so that we don't have to restart it every time we want to make changes so here I am going to check localhost make sure everything still works and we're good to go so I'm gonna keep it running and we can just go ahead and start working so we only have one route which means if we open up the index, the routes folder, the index route is the only one that's serving any kind of response right now. So clearly this is the route that is being returned. So what we're going to do first is we're going to explore different kinds of um, request, not different kinds of requests, uh, how requests are organized. So 
let's see here the best way to do this I'm going to create another handler get handler and we pass in a request response callback function okay and we're going to call this test <coughs> and this is the a test response okay so here I am returning some JSON so it's just going to be raw JSON data so what we can do is head over to localhost 3000 and then slash test and we should see this is a test response great so it's properly connected now here is the URL that we're currently uh, accessing sometimes this is referred to as an endpoint one thing that we can do in Node Express is we can take the endpoint and extract variables from the endpoint. So for example, this word right here, test, can be converted into a variable that can then be returned or used to manipulate the response. So um, let me show you what I mean by that. Here, instead of test, let's remove that and insert the following, colon and then param. Now what I'm doing here is I'm assigning a variable called param which is going to be whatever word is entered at the end of the URL. So for example, uh, what that means is we can grab the param from the request params object. <coughs> so within Node Express, every request has a params object associated with it and we can grab URL parameters by adding this colon right here and then whatever comes after it is the name of the variable param in our case. Um, let's see to make this a little bit less confusing because I'm using the word param a little bit too much here so I want to make this a little bit less confusing Let's go with, um, let's see here, path. So I'm reassigning the value of this variable to path. And so it's going to be rec.params and then path. And I'm now grabbing the value of this word, whatever the user types in. So I can simply return that in the response. This will be a little bit easier to parse. So now, this is no longer hard-coded as test. It, could, it can be whatever word we want and whatever the word is is what gets um, printed over here. So if I enter this it says test and then if I say hello it should say hello. If I say uh, goodbye it'll say goodbye. So what's happening is that the word I'm entering here is the value of this path variable and I'm extracting it right here on line 13 and I'm simply printing it back out in line 16 as JSON data. So this can be extended for uh, as many request parameters as you want. So if I do router.get and then let's say I'm gonna here I'm gonna create another handler with two request parameters so um, let's say uh, profile and then username. So now I have two request parameters. <clears throat> so I can extract both of them from the request params like so. and those can then be returned in whatever format we want so I'm going to do profile and then username so now we have another get handler which has two request parameters profile and username so we can do uh, profile which is probably going to be like a, an ID number so one two three username my username 
profile, username. And then if I do 456, 456, and then um, there we go. So here we have two parameters in this get handler. And this can just go on as much as you want. Obviously, you can add as many request params as you want. So this is one way of extracting dynamic data from a request um, in Node and Express. It's pretty, pretty convenient, very powerful. And this is one way you can extract dynamic data from the incoming URL, or oftentimes referred to as the endpoint. Um, and these are called request parameters. Another way you can do this is through uh, what's called query parameters. Query. So the way query parameters are are, um, are added is through a question mark. So for example, if I go back here, I'm going to add another handler, router.get query. <clears throat> so now keep in mind there is no colon here so this is not a variable this is what we call hard-coded so we have to type in the word query and then test so if I do localhost 3000 slash query it should just return this test output so let's go ahead and do that test excellent so now we can add query params, uh, which, which are added in the form of a question mark. So if I do question mark and then name equals Dan, what I'm doing is I'm adding a query parameter. The key is name and the value is Dan. And this is how you add a query parameter. And we can extract these parameters inside of um, the request object. So let's see, const name equals rec.query dot name. So what I'm doing here is I'm grabbing the name query object from the the endpoint. So I can do name like that. And then whatever I enter here as the name value should be outputted here. So let's go ahead and test that. And there it is. so forth and so on. Um, so that's how you append query parameters to a request object. Uh, and this can also be done indefinitely. So we can also add an occupation key value. So we, we do that. We append more query parameters by using the ampersand and then another key value pair. So occupation equals lawyer. So now we don't see anything because we didn't do anything with the data. So we can do, we can just grab the occupation query parameter and then add the data to the response. And there it is. Dan, programmer, so forth and so on. And that's how you handle query parameters. Now, um, there's many, many. There are many things you can do with this, but one one typical application is by using query parameters or request parameters to dynamically render contents on a page. So what I'm going to do right now is add another page or another template, you might call it, to the views directory. So I'm going to add. I'm going to turn off the server, and then I'm going to cd into the views directory, and I'm going to add a new template called profile dot mustache and then I'm going to cd back to the root and inside the profile dot mustache I'm going to set up a new page a new HTML page Okay, and here I'm going to set up a template um, which can dynamically render 
contents based on query parameters. So let's say the profile name and then since we're using what the, the mustache templating engine this these double braces indicate the dynamic data uh, by virtue of the mustache templating engine which also is uh, how it works for uh, handlebars and um, and Hogan.js so they're all pretty similar so now what we can do is we can head back to our index and inside here instead of rendering JSON we can take we can create a data object pass in the name and the occupation and then we can render the profile template and pass in the data so now whatever the name is here whatever the value of the name is will show up in this placeholder over here and that's one way we can make sure that this dynamic the data is dynamically rendered so if we go back and restart the server so now I'm hitting the query endpoint with the name of LeBron James so we can do that and we should see name LeBron James and then we can add more data to it so we can say occupation and then the data from the, the occupation key from the data object so whatever the value is here is what gets rendered down here and so obviously we can make the data we can change the data and it should reflect dynamically in the page and this is one way we can we can do that so let me just correct the spelling and there we go and you can also do that using the request parameters that we're doing down here so rather than do it um, in this video for to show you what I what I recommend you do is you go through this endpoint right here and and create a template which can render the data dynamically using the request parameters just to make sure you understand how it works and um, that's two different ways you can render data dynamically request uh, I'm sorry respond with data dynamically based on the actual nature of the request which is a very powerful thing to do so um, and then we can render it either as JSON or an HTML template um, and a variety of other things but those are the two most common so so that's it hopefully you got all that working um, and thanks for watching Hello, welcome back to our Node and Express tutorial series on Turbo 360. This, in the previous video, we set up a couple dynamic requests by showing a few ways to render data dynamically using either request parameters or request query parameters. And so I'm going to run the project again real quick to make sure everything is still in working order. And then we'll move on to the next uh, topic. So here I'm starting the server. and I head over to localhost and here's one example request from the previous video and you can see this is these are using query parameters to populate the template with dynamic data so if I change the name to Alice uh, it'll say Alice if I change the occupation to lawyer uh, so forth and so on so good it still works we're good to go there so now let's move on so here we are in the index route file at the end of the previous video <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you take a look at the router, you'll see that we have a series of GET requests. But that's not the only type of request. There are there are a, a handful of types of requests, HTTP requests. But there are four that matter the most, and those four are POST, GET, PUT, and DELETE. There are a few more, but these are the ones that matter the most. So let's set up another request handler to handle a different type of request, in this case a POST request. So let's do router.post. 
<clears throat> and let's call this um, post. And we'll have this send back just some JSON with a confirmation key and the data key will be the post parameter. So in a post request, the parameters generally come in the body object of the key. So what we want to do is extract those parameters from the request, like so. The body object of the request, excuse me. And then this is what comes from the client side, and we can just send that right back. So basically we're just sending the data right back. Now normally, this data comes from a post form. Um, and so that's why uh, there it's called a post form because the form typically sends a post request to the server. So a post form is very typical uh, when you're signing up for a new website or you're entering your email for like a newsletter. Almost certainly you're sending a post request and that's done through a post form. So let's go ahead and set this up as well. So let's head over to our views directory and then the index.mustache, which is where the home page is right now. So I'm going to run the dev server so you can see what it looks like. And we're going to remove the contents of this home page. And instead, we're going to insert a post form. So all the way up here, let's get rid of all this. Okay, so let's set up our post form right now, and let's have the post form uh, take a few inputs. So the input type is going to be text, and the name is going to be, uh, let's say, name for now. And then let's add another one, occupation. And we need one more input whose type is a submit type and the value should be submit. So this is a very, very typical post form. So if I reload the home page, I should see that post form. I'm going to add a few small things here. So placeholder equals name and then placeholder equals occupation okay makes it a little easier to see and then now we have our post form a couple things here we need to direct the data from this post form to our post handler right here so if you go back to the app.js you'll you may recall our index route is connected already so we can just leave that alone and we can we want to send it to the slash post endpoint so to do that we do action equals slash post. So we are now sending the data to the slash post endpoint. And then the method should also be post. So this will now direct it, the data here to this handler. And the data will come in the form of a, of a JSON object with name and occupation keys whose values are populated by, populated by whatever the user typed into those fields. And then the response will be this JSON uh, response with the, that JSON object pretty much bounced right back to us in the browser. Let's go ahead and try that. So let's, let's fill this out. Okay, and let's see what happens. And there it is. So here we have our confirmation the data and then the name of the and the occupation so confirmation and then it just bounced back the JSON object right back to us like so and so if we go back to the home page we can keep on testing
and that's it. And so this is a typical way to set up a post handler. Um, so this might be like a registration form. So instead of submit, let's say sign up. And uh, that should change the button here. And just for good measure, let's add a separate, a whole new route just for this, just so you can kind of see how that would take shape. So I'm going to turn off the server and cd into the routes directory and create a register route like that. And then head back to the root level. And then if I open up the index route, I'm going to copy the imports into the register route. And then if I go back to the index route, all the way in the bottom, don't forget to export the router. Otherwise, it won't work. And then here, I'm going to set up a post handler. Um, called user <clears throat> and I'm just going to grab the same response pattern from the index route and I'm going to use this route instead so we need to now register or connect this route to the app by going back to the app.js and we need to import it so this is the register route and then we need to use it here so now just just to make sure you understand how this works we're connecting the register route to this path called register and then within the register route we have another handler called the user so in order to send this through we have to go to our endpoint and connect the register path with the user extension for that. So make sure you understand that because that could be a little confusing at first. So we have to connect the register path to the register route and then within the register route we have a user handler which we then specify in here. So now I am going to do one more thing um, path or route I'm going to add one more key value in the response right here so that we can be certain that we're seeing this route handler instead of the old one. In fact, we should just comment this out. So let's give it a shot. Okay, the reload and uh, let's see. Um, Oops. Uh, programmer. And here we can see the register route key so we can we can conclude with certainty that we are using the new route file which is here rather than the index route file. So basically the only reason I did that was just to show you how to keep on adding more routes um, from your routes directory so that you can make this as modular as you want it to be. And that's a pretty typical pattern in a Node Express project. So that's it. Hopefully you got all that working. This is how you connect, uh, how you uh, set up a post request with a corresponding post form. And, uh, and that's it. So in the next um, video, we will continue working with the templates, uh, index and profile to, um, to show some additional functionality with the mustache templating engine. So uh, thanks for watching and uh, stay tuned for that. Hello and welcome back to our Node and Express.js tutorial on Turbo 360. In the previous video we set up a post request and sent some post data from a form to our, our server. So that shows now how to create a post request and we also have a get request. The other request types uh, like put and delete basically are set up the same way. So in this video we're going to move on to some new new material. We're going to, we're going to create some dynamic um, requests and show dy uh, dynamic data based on the actual type of request and render it on a page using our mustache templating engine. So. 
Hopefully that makes sense. We're going to create a small list of profiles of programmers and then based on a query input or a parameter from the URL request, we're going to grab one of the profiles and then render it on the page, the mustache template, um, using the data from our, our, our collection. So let's go ahead and set that up. So first thing we want to do is create a profiles object. And we're going to create a couple profiles uh, with a key value of using the username as the key. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the value is going to be the profile data. So let's say we have um, Dequan. That's going to be me. Jobs. And Bill Gates. So let's say we have no, this is not to suggest that I'm in the category of these other guys, but just need some names to work with. Okay. Let's see. Okay, and then we're going to add one more thing uh, for languages. So um, let's say JavaScript, Swift, and Python. And for Steve Jobs, it's going to be objective. C, Swift, and C++. Bill Gates is going to be C, C Sharp, and Java. Okay, we'll go with that. And so now we have a collection of profiles in here that where we can query um, using the username as the key to, to fetch the profile. So it'll make more sense when we do it. So Let's go down here and reuse this profile username route that we had before. And instead of just spitting the parameters back out, let's grab the profile from the profiles object using the username as the key. And then we can just return that as the JSON response. So we have three usernames, Dequan, S Jobs, and B Gates. So let's try it, try it out and see. Let's see here. And sample project. Okay. So let's try it out and see if we can get the profile from this collection using the username parameter. Okay, we're getting an error here. Profile has already been declared. So that's because I did it over here. So let's go with current profile, excuse me. Okay, and that should take care of that problem. So now let's go ahead and go to localhost 3000 <clears throat> and then profile and then dequan. And here I am, Dan Quan, company self and languages. And then if I do uh, Steve Jobs, there it is. And then B Gates, and there it is, excellent. So now that we've confirmed that this works, let's do one quick piece of error handling if current profile doesn't exist. We should return a JSON confirmation that indicates that something went wrong. So fail and then message. <clears throat> uh, 
and then profile username not found and that should be a pretty good error message and we should also put a success confirmation here just to be consistent okay so now if I do that we have our success confirmation we have our profile data and then we can type in some other name um, LeBron James and profile LeBron James not found very good great now that we've confirmed that this works let's go ahead and render this data in a template instead so if we open up our profile mustache template we have the name right and that is currently in here so that's good to go let's say company and then let's render that company and then let's render the template rather than just this raw JSON so let's get rid of that and let's do res.render and we want to render the template and then we pass in the data current profile and the current profile has the keys that corresponds to these placeholders right here and then if I reload well it's going to say not found but if I do my name there it is and then that's jobs so forth and so on B gates now you may have noticed that each profile now has an array of languages which we have yet to render in here so um, let's let's go ahead and, and get that showing up so if we go to our template now the question then becomes how do we loop through an array using the mustache templating engine so let's go ahead and set up a section here called languages and then let's loop let's create an ordered list where we can loop through the array of languages so the way you loop through an array in the mustache templating engine is you grab the array like that and then we add a hashtag in front of it and then we close it like that and then that will loop through the array of languages and then that's just an array of strings so what we can do is inside here we do double braces and then a period which indicates to just render the string as is so if we reload that we should see C, C sharp and Java what I forgot however is we want to put these inside of an li tag so that is my fault let's take care of that right now and so now these will show up in li tags and that's what we want so this is how you loop through an array of strings if the array had a had an array of objects then we can reference each individual key inside the objects in here uh, I hope that makes sense so um, let's try one of the other profiles that's me we did Bill Gates and then Steve Jobs great um, let's do one more thing for good measure since we've already went over the material let's add a form to the bottom here where we can add a profile so a profile is going to have name Uh, company right name company and languages company and languages okay and then let's add the input tag the submit tag, excuse me. Add 
profile. And that'll show up right here. And let's see here. Let's go back to our index. And we have no post handlers right now. But we probably have one for register. So let's send this. Now let's add it to the index. Let's see here. Let's do one right here. And a post for add profile. And for now, let's just have it return the raw JSON. So we grab the body from the request, just like we did in the last video. And then let's just return the JSON for now, just to make sure it's working. That's always a good idea, just to make sure the data is successfully going through. So let's see what we get here. So this is going to the add profile endpoint of the index. Don't forget that. So we want to send the action to the add profile like that. And then the method is, of course, post. So let's see what we get here when we do that. Um, Elon Musk Tesla. I don't know. Uh, uh, go Kotlin. Okay, how's that? Okay, so we're not getting the data back there. So let's see what went wrong. So we have type. So what I forgot are the name. So I, everywhere I pr I typed type here, it really should have been name. So my apologies for that. And really the type is text. So my sincere apologies. But this is why we test early and we test often. And this is going to be type submit. So let's go back and try it again. So Elon Musk, Tesla, Go, and Kotlin. Let's see here. So here is the data being sent from the form to our post handler on the input route. And it looks good except for the languages. Bear in mind this has to be an array and right now we're getting a string. So what we want to do is over here we want to grab the languages. Languages equals rec.body languages and then split it by the comma. So every time I separate at a comma, at a language, I do it after a comma. And so one way I can just sort of quickly take care of this is by doing it like that. And so I'm reassigning it to the parameters under the languages key. That should be in quotation marks, excuse me so that it'll con basically convert that into an array and then it'll it'll uh, add, add it, um, render the JSON as an array. So let's try it again right now. Elon Musk, Tesla, Go, Kotlin. And now we have it as an array looking good and I actually did forget one field, which is the username. So let's go ahead and add that, because we're going to need that. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and test it just to be sure. Elon Musk, E Musk, Tesla. Go, Kotlin. And there we go, because we're going to need that to access the profile in our follow up request. So, what we want to do now is we want to grab the profiles object, the collection. And we want to add the new profile to this collection, so based on the username. 
body username equals that. And then instead of sending back the JSON, what we want to do is just redirect to the profile slash username right here, profile, username, endpoint. So we can do slash profile, slash, and then the username. And now it should render the profile page. It should re-render this page with the new profile added, rendered to the collection. So let's try that right now. He must Tesla go and cut when and then it'll, it won't look like it's actually reloading it'll just reshow with the new user but look at the endpoint here this is the important thing to take note is that it is now hitting the endpoint which is fetching the profile by the username key and then rendering that profile uh, based on the current collection so we can we can keep doing that. So if I add another profile, so let's see here. Mark Zuckerberg. Zuck, Facebook, uh, PHP, and Java. There we go, and it worked. So, so yeah, this uh, uh, this is uh, a quick way we can show how you can render dynamic data using Node and Express and the Mustache Templating Engine. Uh, some an important takeaway here is how to render uh, loops and, and, um, and arrays inside of a Mustache Templating Engine. And we're also using some concepts from the previous couple of videos and bringing it together to show how things can work um, uh, in, in a, as a greater uh, project in a Node Express environment. So now that we got that working, that's good to go. In the next video, I'm going to show a couple more concepts specific to Node and Express, specifically what's called middleware, which I will explain in the next video. And then we will wrap up the series by deploying this project to a simple server. And, uh, and that's it. So thanks for watching. I hope you got everything working, and I'll see you in the next video. Hello and welcome back to our Node and Express tutorial series on Turbo 360. In the previous video, we set up the functionality to add a new profile to our project so that we can add profiles and then when that's done, the response redirects our page to that new profile page. Let's go ahead and test that again real quick just to make sure everything still works. So here I am in the root level of my project and I'm going to run the dev server and head over to one of the default profiles, in this case Bill Gates. And let's add a profile. So I'm going to add Elon Musk again. And then go and then Kotlin. And then here we go. We now see Elon Musk showing up in the project uh, rendered in this template. So that's good to go. So now in this video, we're going to set up, we're going to make use of some of these static assets. So if you recall, the static assets are typically stored in the public directory. Now, in this particular scaffolding engine, the Turbo scaffolding engine, the public directory is by default set as the static asset directory. So you don't have to do anything at all if you want to use the, continue using the public directory. If you do, however, want to change it, you can head over to app.js and you'll see in here, in this commented out block, there's a config object where you can set the static asset directory right here, as well as the views template directory if you want to change that for uh, whatever reason. Um, so you can go ahead and change that over here if you want to. Just make sure you instantiate the app with the config variable. Um, and that should, be, that should make those changes. But for now, we're going to use the defaults because it's pretty standard. So let's go ahead and import our CSS right here in the head tag, which is where it normally goes. And inside the scaffold, you'll see that there is a bootstrap CSS uh, file already inserted.
so we can import that right now um, in our page. That. Okay, and the important thing to note is right here is the actual file reference. You will see that we have the CSS slash bootstrap specified, but we do not specify public. We do not need to do that. Uh, as a matter of fact, this will actually break it. So we want to. We don't want that there. The public directory is is automatically configured as the static asset directory. So this will automatically look up in the public directory and then go right to CSS and then bootstrap CSS. So if we go ahead and run the server again right now, we should see some stylistic changes on, on account of bootstrap. Let me go back to Bill Gates. So now we see some stylistic changes. Um, one thing that I've already added is a bootstrap class right here called container. So if I remove that, you'll see that we're, we lost some of the padding around the edges. So here you can add a class called container and we are using a, this is a bootstrap class that gives us a little bit of st uh, padding around the margins, excuse me, around the edges. So here the important takeaway is understanding how to import your static assets, in this case the CSS. Let's continue that process by adding some images. So right now in our default project, we have three default profiles, uh, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and myself. I'm actually going to remove myself because I don't think we need images of me up there. So let's grab images for Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and then set those images right here. Image. So let's grab some images. So head over to Google. Let's grab one for Bill Gates. Click on that. Right click on this. Copy the image address. And then slide that guy onto your desktop or wherever you want to do your work. Okay, so that's one. Then let's do another one for Steve Jobs. Same thing. Copy the image address, paste it into a browser, and then slide that onto your desktop. Steve Jobs. Great. So now we have some images, and I'm going to do one more for Elon Musk. <clears throat> this one looks good. Okay, this one is not letting me slide it over to my desktop, so I'm just going to pick another one. Perfect. And the name of this file already even matches. Actually, I'm going to change this to eMusk just to make it a little easier. Okay, great. So now let's get these images into our static asset directory. So here I am. I'm going to open up the public directory and then the images, which only has the turbo default image, so we don't we're not going to use that. Let's go ahead and drop our three profile images inside here right there. So B. Gates, E. Musk, and Steve Jobs, S. Jobs. So now over here we can do slash images and then S. Jobs dot J. P. G. And then right. We can just confirm that. And then over here we can do images and then B. Gates dot J. P. G. Notice once again we are not referencing the public directory, we're, we are referencing the images directly, images directory directly, because the public 
folder is implied. So again, this would you do not need this. That will actually break the file path. You only need that. So now that we have that successfully added, we can add the image in the profile template by doing that. Now remember, the image key is part of the object, the profile object. So when we get a profile down here, the image key is stored inside this current profile object right here. It's already in there. So what we can do is test that by going back here and then seeing Bill Gates and then Steve Jobs. Now the reason I added Elon Musk is so that we can test that by adding it to the form down here. So what we can do is add another field called image and then the placeholder will be images slash example jpg and then once I head back here now when you go down to the bottom you'll see an additional field for images for an image so we can do um, actually that that placeholder isn't very ideal so we want to do image and then parentheses like that so we can do Elon Musk e Musk slash images slash e Musk dot jpg that's this image right here Tesla go and then Kotlin and there it is and let's do one last thing because uh, these some of these images are bigger than I thought so let's go ahead and use a CSS a custom CSS to add some of our own styling so I'm going to turn the server off and we're going to head over to the public directory and then the CSS directory we want to add our own custom CSS called uh, style CSS and then head back to the root directory and then just so I don't forget I'm going to import that right away so I don't forget and then inside here let's create a class a rule for the header one tag and let's say this is color red and let's just see if this works so if I run the dev server Let's head back to Bill Gates. And there is our red color, uh, thereby confirming that the CSS import was successful. So let's go ahead and start adding some CSS rules here. So this image, let's give it a class called profile image. And then let's head back to our style and then let's set the max width to 360 px and let's see if that shrinks it down it's actually a bit more than I wanted let's try 260 okay so now if I go to Steve Jobs it'll be the same and then I have to add Elon Musk again because I restarted the server so we have to add him again but Elon Musk was the biggest one as far as the image is concerned so this should now look the same size. And there we go. And that gives us a little bit of better consistency across the UI. And for this H1 tag, let's do text transform and then capitalize. So that these don't show up in lower case and there we go so I don't want to get too carried away with the CSS obviously this can go on for a while but the main idea here is, is to understand how to use these static assets in your project um, uh, in a node express project properly so here we're making good use of some CSS files as well as some images 
from our static asset directory. Um, and that's it. So hopefully you got all that working. And um, that's it. So I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Hey guys, welcome back to our Node and Express tutorial series on Turbo 360. In the previous video, we set up some basic um, static asset handling by adding images to our profiles and some basic, very simple CSS styling as well. So in this video, we're going to introduce a new concept called middleware, which I will um, show you, which I'll explain by demonstration. Um, before, but before we get to that, let's make sure everything still works. So here I am at the base level of my project, and let's run the dev server. And then I'm going to head over to localhost 3000, and we're going to check the profiles page. So localhost 3000, and then profiles, and make sure we still see the profiles from before. Um, and keep in mind the Elon Musk one isn't showing up because that's something we added later on and when you restart the server the array resets. So one thing we should have done in the previous video is connect these names to the hyperlinks for their respective profile page. So if I do S jobs I see the individual Steve Jobs page. I should be able to click on this just to get right to that. So let's head over to the profiles template and in here where the names show up, let's actually connect a hyperlink instead of just rendering the name. <clears throat> and then in here, we should use the placeholder for username. Then if we look in here, yes, every profile comes with the username with it, so they should properly show up and then don't forget it's actually slash profile slash username and that should connect those individual names to their respective pages like so whoops and then and there it is so we're good to go now let's say on each page the profiles page and the individual profile page let's say above here right here we want to add a an element uh, called timestamp like that and that should show we eventually want this to show the current date so right now we are on the profiles template so let's go ahead and make that work for the profiles template right here so let's say we have a timestamp object let's just say current date for now and then let's add that to the data that's passed through to the template which means now we can go to the profiles template itself and access that using the standard mustache templating syntax so let's go ahead and make sure that that shows up and there's current date. Now let's actually have it show the current date. I think that's really what we're going for here, right? So we can just do new date, the JavaScript date object, and then we can just pass that through as a string to the template so that we can actually see the current date um, rather than just a hard-coded string. So now that we have that working over on the profile template, let's go ahead and do the same thing in the individual profile page above the name. So now here we have the timestamp, which should show up above the name. And let's do the same thing. So we go down to the profile page, which is right here. And we get the current, we get the current date. And the current profile object right here is what's being passed through. So we do timestamp. We add a timestamp key and then the value is the current timestamp. So now if I click on one of these usernames I see the current timestamp over here as well. And that worked. So now the important thing to take away here 
is that the timestamp object here on line 100 as well as the timestamp object that we used up on top right here is is the same thing we're doing the same logic in both requests actually I should also have the two string like so technically it'll work either way but I just want to be consistent with the data types so what we don't want to do is have the uh, have this duplicate logic all over the place this is a very important principle uh, in programming you do not want to repeat yourself so this is one area where middleware can really help us out what we can do is create a what's called a middleware function which will apply this piece of logic this individual piece of logic to multiple request routes if we if we wanted to so right here on line 36 we can apply that to multiple request routes or all the request routes literally all of them or um, we can de determine which routes uh, we want to apply it to so let me show you how that works and it'll make more sense so if we go to the app.js let's first of all get rid of all this uh, commented out sample code we're not going to use that so here are the two routes that we have index and register over here we can apply some middleware uh, we can add a middleware function which will which will, whose logic will apply to all the routes that follow it that's essentially the main purpose of middleware so the way that works is we say app and then use and then we pass in the standard request and res object but this time we also have to pass in what's called next and you'll see why in a second and then here this function is called the middleware function where we can conduct some logic which will take place before these routes return a response so uh, a very typical usage of middleware is to add an object to the request argument so that all the subsequent routes will have the updated request piece so if I do a request and then timestamp I can do test timestamp and then here's where the next function comes in we have to call the next function otherwise the middleware will do what's called hang it will not proceed to the routes until we call next so don't forget that it's very easy to forget so now the main thing is that every request object in the subsequent routes will have a timestamp property attached to it and in this case that timestamp property is just a test string and that's it so if we go back here we can take this timestamp on line 36 and remove that and then we can use the request timestamp object right there because this was assigned via the middleware over here and then we can use the same object down below right here so that we don't have to conduct this log logic multiple times and we can kind of we can cut down on the duplicate code it's kind of like a, uh, a, a it's a method of refactoring that makes this more um, easy to reason about so now if I reload we get the test timestamp from the middleware function in both cases and that means it worked so now we can go back to the middleware and instead of uh, adding a test string I am going to do a variable like that I'm going to create a date and then we're going to attach that to the request timestamp property but I'm just going to create it I'm just going to convert it into a string just to be sure and now the request timestamp should have the updated accurate timestamp um, rather than the test string and that's it so it worked so the main idea here is to use a middleware function like this so that we can apply logic to all of the subsequent requests or only certain requests if we want to for example if I take this middleware function and I put it down here uh, this middleware will only um, excuse me wrong spot down here excuse me this middleware will only apply to the register routes uh, and the index routes will not have it 
and so you can decide which routes should make use of the certain middleware and which ones uh, don't. So one way we can we can see that in action is sometimes we'll see a function timestamp rec res next. Sometimes you'll see it like this and then we can say app use timestamp like that and then this is basically the same thing it's, it has no practical difference um, you'll see that the, the timestamps still show up but now if I want this to only apply to the register functions I would apply the timestamp middleware right there instead of over here over here and that's how you can apply middleware only to certain routes if you want to so that's up to you so that's a quick rundown of middleware uh, it's a bit simplified but this is a good introduction to how what middleware is and how you would want to use it in certain cases uh, it's a very powerful feature of node and uh, the node express ecosystem and i strongly encourage you to um, get more comfortable with middleware uh, because um, it's used a lot so Hopefully that makes sense, and uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Hey guys, welcome back to our Node and Express tutorial series on Turbo 360. In the previous video, we wrapped up our sample project by adding a middleware function that renders the dates on all the pages and requests. So let's go ahead and make sure that still works. And then we're going to deploy this project to the to the internet to make sure it works on an actual live server as well. So here I'm running the dev server. I'm going to head over to localhost 3000 and check out the profiles page. And here's the timestamp middleware that we we added last time. And if I click on one of these, I get the, the user I clicked on, as well as the middleware here as well. So that's going to be it for this project. So let's go ahead and get this guy up on a server so we can make sure that it works on a real environment. So we're going to use Turbo to host for that. So head over to turbo360.co. And if you haven't already, go ahead and create a free account down here. It is free, so don't worry about that. And the hosting is free as well. Uh, until you decide to connect a live domain. So once you have that, make sure you have the Turbo CLI, which we did install in the first video, but just in case you missed that, to install the Turbo CLI, you do sudo npm install turbo-cli and then dash g for global, like that. Now, if you are using a Windows machine, you do not need the sudo. It's very important to recognize that. So you can just start from npm install, um, but on Mac or Linux, you do need the sudo. So go ahead and make sure you have that properly installed. The version as of the time of this video is right here. So make sure that your version number is at least this number or higher, and you should be good to go. Next thing you want to do on the Turbo CLI is log in to the CLI. So you do turbo login, and then you enter the account uh, email password that you use to sign up here as well. So it's the same thing. And then we're good to go. Once you, once you are logged into the CLI, head over to Turbo and then click on My Projects right here and then click on Sites and then create a new site. So um, call it Demo Site or whatever you want to call it. And don't worry about the description and then click Create Site when you're ready. And when that's ready to go, you should see an admin dashboard that looks like this. So what we need here is the app ID. So go ahead and grab your app ID. This is the unique identifier for your project. So go ahead and grab that. And then head back to your terminal. And then do turbo app. And then paste in the app ID like that. And what this does is it connects your local project to the remote environment on Turbo that you created when you created a new project. Uh, basically that creates a new environment on the Turbo servers for your project which you can then deploy. 
So we're going to do that right, right now next. So head back to your ter terminal and then do the following. Turbo deploy and then press return. And this will deploy your project to the Turbo staging environment, which normally takes about a minute. So just give it a couple seconds while it goes up. And when that's done, it will provide to you a staging link, uh, a URL for your project that you can go ahead and enter into the browser to make sure it still work, everything works properly. So we will see that in a few seconds. Okay, great. So when it's done, you should see this command right here, deploy complete, and grab the staging URL, and then copy and paste that into the browser. And you should see the project, and it should be the same project. So if I do slash profiles, I should see the project as well as the timestamp middleware. I have our two profiles. We have Steve Jobs right here. It's showing up just, just fine, just like it did on local. Here's the local version, and here's the remote staging version. And if I click on Bill Gates, same thing, and then same thing on local as well. So, so that's it. It worked. Uh, this is free, so you can use the staging environment, the free staging environment, as much as you want. Um, and this is also uh, scalable. It does all the scaling for you, so you don't have to worry about provisioning more server capacity or anything like that. If, uh, if your project gets a lot of traffic. So we're going to finish off the tutorial here. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you got a lot out of it. There are many more things to learn, obviously. This is just scratching the surface of Node, Node and Express. So if, you, if you're wondering where to go next, you want to head over to turbo360.co and then tutorials like this. <clears throat> and this is a good spot to continue working on your, your Node, Express, and your full stack JavaScript um, education. This is current. This is the current series we are you are watching right now. So if you just wrap this up, my recommendation for the next one is this this right here, the MongoDB tutorial. This is where we connect our project to an actual Mongo database and deploy the MongoDB as well, so that you can persist data and do more uh, more complex operations. And once you get through this tutorial series, the next logical step would be right here, creating a REST API. So this would be a good sequence to follow if you are new to Node Express and full stack JavaScript. And, um, and yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, you can reach me at dquan at turbo360.co. And once you join Turbo, you should also get a, an invitation to the Slack channel. And I'm often on Slack as well. So you can probably find me over on Slack. And I, I'll, I'll try and answer your questions over there as well. So that's it. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial series. And I will see you in the next uh, set. Take care.